Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And if you are watching this video on the day that it goes live, you will be doing so on the 19th of May 2023, which by my maths is 487 years to the day since Anne Boleyn was executed in the Tower of London. In fact, I'm going to be at the Tower of London today to see some of my friends who are all heading there to mark this particular anniversary. Today, I want to look at Anne Boleyn's time spent at the Tower of London, not only after her fall in 1536, but also when she was at the very zenith of her rise in 1533. I think that existing locations can be a really useful way to explore moments from the past, and I certainly know that I am not the only one who is thrilled to experience history where it happened, so to speak. But before we dive into that, I want to say a massive thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. When I'm visiting heritage sites, either for work or for pleasure, I am usually reliant on that location's public Wi-Fi in order to be able to work. And NordVPN helps me keep my information safe while I'm doing so. A VPN is a virtual private network. It works as a barrier between you and potential cyber threats, such as hacking and malware, or surveillance and trackers. I remember a few years ago, I was using the public Wi-Fi at the British Library, and somebody messaged me saying that they could see my files. They referred to what I was researching at the time, and they even said they thought that it was interesting. Now, I think they mostly did this to show me that they could, but I have to say I did find it very unnerving and frankly upsetting. I just wish that I'd known about NordVPN at the time. To this day, I still don't know how that person saw my files, and I certainly wouldn't know how to go about avoiding the same thing happening again. Fortunately though, NordVPN doesn't require me to have an advanced degree in cybersecurity to operate it. In fact, you can be protected online with only one click. Just pick a location and you're good to go. Because NordVPN lets you select from a whole host of other locations to connect through, you can access the content you want regardless of where you are in the world. No location blocking can stop us now, but that's not all. Because with one account, you can protect up to six devices. NordVPN also offers a 30-day money-back guarantee to all users. Click the link in my description box to find out more and to sign up for NordVPN. If you click on this link and purchase the two-year plan, NordVPN will give you four months for free. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. And now let's take a look at the Tower of London and how it functioned as one of the key sites where the rise and fall of Anne Boleyn would play out. I think that in many cases, if we were to be asked to think of the time that Anne spent at the Tower of London, then our minds would perhaps naturally be turned to those tragic events of 1536. And certainly, we will be taking a look at those today. But before we do so, we are going to rewind time to almost exactly three years earlier. To make ready for the festivities that were designed to celebrate Anne's elevation to be Queen of England, a large project of works had been undertaken at the Tower of London. These building and repair works had begun by at least the summer of 1532, and Henry VIII would visit the site to check on the progress of the works in the December of 1532, which is, of course, not long after he and Anne had returned from their trip to France. It is commonly thought that while this couple were held in Calais by bad weather, or perhaps on the eventual journey home, Henry and Anne finally began to sleep together. Anne would soon become pregnant, and the couple would marry secretly, we think, on the 25th of January. But earlier in that month, on the 1st, the following entry was added to the letters and papers, foreign and domestic, of King Henry VIII. It details the work that had been and would be done to make the tower ready for what was about to come, and as we can see, it is quite extensive. 
The list includes, quote, a pair of gates grated, which hang next St Thomas's Tower, and a pair of stairs going down to the water from the said gate, and piles driven that the stairs stand upon. These works happened here by the Byward Postern, the entrance through which the tower's most important guests would, by custom, enter. Improvements were also made to the royal apartments, both structurally and decoratively. In some instances, it seems that entirely new structures were created. We are told that there was, quote, made anew in the Queen's dining chamber a great carol window on the west side, with new leaning places, and a halpus underfoot, new made. A halpus refers to a raised part of the floor, a step, maybe a dais. Two new leaning places in the window on the east side of the same chamber. A great piece of timber laid over the carol window to bear the roof with joists, etc. And a halpus, again, that raised part of the floor, or a step, which stood before the chimney. A new clear story. This refers to a series of windows set above to increase the amount of light coming into a room. They were made in the west end of the great chamber, in the entry next to the closet, the breadth of the house with a penthouse over it for the weather, a partition made between the said entry and chamber with a clear story in the upper end and a door to it, a jakes, meaning a privy or a toilet, made in the inner chamber within the said great chamber, etc. If we take a look at Ivan Lapper's artistic impression of what the tower complex is believed to have looked like by the end of the reign of King Henry VIII, we can see that there is a large complex of buildings that stand at the south side of the White Tower. All of these buildings have now either disappeared or stand as ruins. The Cold Harbour Gate and Tower is ruined, as is the wall of the inner ward that ran between that and what is now the Wakefield Tower. The wardrobe tower also stands as a ruin. The royal lodgings, gardens and great hall all leave no trace today. Arguably, the most evident remaining sign of all of the alterations that King Henry VIII commissioned to happen at the Tower of London between 1532 and 1533 can be found in those four domes or cupolas that sit at the top of the four corners of the White Tower. I think it would have been nearly impossible for anyone who was living or working in or near to the Tower of London to remain unaware of these changes as they were taking place. Of course, during these years in England, change was very much the order of the day. Because it was not only the queens that were being transposed, there was also profound changes afoot in both legal and ecclesiastical matters. And all of these changes were happening at the same time because they had become, in many ways, indivisible from one another. In 1531, Henry was recognised as, quote, the only protector and supreme head of the English church and clergy as far as the law of Christ allows. The next year, following the death of the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Warham, the king selected the reform-minded Berlin-favoured Thomas Cranmer as his replacement. And so, Henry's seemingly previously interminable great matter was now able to be swiftly resolved. Cranmer was formally consecrated on the 30th of March. On the 11th of April, so he's working pretty quickly, he wrote to Henry to inform him that his marriage to Catherine of Aragon was a problem, and thus he was going to have to try its validity in the church court. This trial began on the 10th of May. On the 23rd of May, Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon was determined to be invalid. On the 28th of May, his marriage to Anne Boleyn was judged to be legal and true. This timing was tight, because on the very next day, the 29th of May, Anne was rowed from Greenwich to the Tower of London. On this day, the River Thames would have been filled with barges for all of those who were involved in the procession, and presumably a few who just got on the river to have a good look. Each barge would have been decorated to the highest possible and acceptable standard. Equally, those within the barges would have been dressed to impress. For example, 
The 16th century chronicler Edward Hall described the appearance of, quote, the mayor and his brethren all in scarlet, and such as were knights had collars of S's. Those are those famous S chains of office that we see in portraits. And the remnant having good chains, and the counts of the city with them assembled at St Mary Hill, and at one of the clock descended to the new stair to their barge, which was garnished with many goodly banners and streamers, and richly covered, in which barge were schwarms and shag bushes, and diverse other instruments, which continually made goodly harmony. This was designed to be a spectacle. According to Hall, there was, quote, a foist or wafter full of ordnance, in which foist was a great dragon continually moving and casting wildfire, and round about the said foist stood terrible monsters and wild men casting fire and making hideous noises. On the left hand of the mare was another foist, in the which was a mount, and on the same stood a white falcon crowned upon a rot of gold, environed with white roses and red, which was the Queen's device, about which mount sat virgins, singing and playing sweetly. Next after the mayor followed his fellowship, the haberdashers. Next after them, the mercers, then the grocers, and so every company in his order. And last of all, the mayor's and sheriff's officers every company having melody in his barge by himself, and goodly garnished with banners, and some garnished with silk, and some with arras, and rich carpets, which was a goodly sight to behold. Hall's account continues, quote, At three of the clock, the Queen appeared in rich cloth of gold, and entered into her barge, accompanied with diverse ladies and gentlewomen, and in continent, the citizens set forwards in their order. Now, I'm assuming that the use of incontinent in this period had a rather different meaning to the one that it does now, otherwise it would have presumably created quite a mess. I'm assuming it means something on the lines of and together, or and in order, and one after another, perhaps in concert, the citizens set forwards in their order. Their minstrels continually playing and the bachelor's barge going on the Queen's right hand, which she took great pleasure to behold. About the Queen's barge were many noblemen, as the Duke of Suffolk, the Marquis Dorset, the Earl of Wiltshire, her father, the Earls of Arundel, Derby, Rutland, Worcester, Huntingdon, Sussex, Oxford, and many bishops and noblemen, every one in his barge, which was a goodly sight to behold. She thus being accompanied rode toward the tower, and in the mean way, the ships which were commanded to lie on the shore for letting of the barges shot diverse peals of guns, and or she landed, there was a marvellous shot out of the tower as ever was heard there, and at her landing there met with her the Lord Chamberlain, with the officers of arms, and brought her to the king, which received her with loving countenance, at the postern by the waterside, and kissed her. And then she turned back again, and thanked the mayor and the citizens with many goodly words, and so entered into the tower. This was Anne's, and for that matter Henry's, moment of triumph. Clearly, they were keen to proclaim the fact, both visually and also audibly. Although today the River Thames continues to draw the interest of Londoners and visitors alike, when Anne was part of this procession on that river, the Thames was the quickest and arguably the safest way to move between places in London, particularly between the palaces and noble houses that were dotted along the river's edge. People would have taken notice of there being just one richly decorated barge, and here there is a cavalcade of them. Add to that the music and the cannon fire that accompanies this procession, plus the works that have been going on at the tower in the run-up to it, I would imagine that Henry's decision to greet Anne on the wharf, to kiss her and then lead her into the tower, would have had a fair few eyes upon it, which I'm guessing was probably the point. 
I do, however, find myself wondering what those witnesses might have made of what they saw. Was it the talk of workshops, alehouses, and even the dinner tables in the surrounding areas? In this regard, Hall tells us, quote, But for to speak of the people that stood on every shore to behold the sight, he that saw it would not believe it. I find that particular quotation tantalising. Is it meant to be read as a positive or a negative thing? Those who saw it would not believe it. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Henry and Anne, like their monarchical predecessors, I think recognised the propaganda of the Tower of London site. For centuries it has been, and arguably continues to be, a key part in the shaping of our national narrative or narratives. It is clear that William the Conqueror recognised this, towards the start of the Tower site as we know it, as he took to using cutting-edge technology to construct his tower. He did so before the eyes of a no-doubt awestruck population, a population that William was looking to rule over. William is showing the people that are living in the single-storey dwellings around the tower, and indeed around the country, that although the Normans might be outnumbered, and they certainly were, they were not to be underestimated. There was now a new system to follow. This tower announced it, and it was going to be hard, if not impossible, for anyone to gainsay it. I would say that through this 16th century display, Henry VIII is doing something very similar to his Norman predecessors. He has recognised the propaganda value of the Tower of London complex and he is using it to tell London, and in turn the wider country, that there was now a new queen. But not just a new queen. Because, of course, Henry has rewritten reality. He is now saying that he is assured, and they should be too, that this new queen is his only rightful queen. What had occurred before was nothing more than a mistake. Just as had occurred with the Normans, there was now a new system in operation, and Henry's people, his subjects, had better get used to it. Anne and Henry stayed in the refurbished royal apartments. They celebrated together in the Great Hall. Perhaps they even stole a quiet, satisfied moment with each other in the gardens. On the evening of the 30th of May, The 18 men who had been chosen to be made Knights of the Bath in honour of this occasion began their ceremonial preparations at the Tower. I do have a video on this particular chivalric order that I will be leaving linked. The following morning, they were dubbed by King Henry VIII. And after this, there was a great procession, which was filled with various entertainments on the route. The party travelled by road from the Tower towards Westminster. This processional party and those who had assembled to watch it enjoyed the sumptuous style in which this party travelled. There was music, fitting orations, pageants, poetry and even a wine fountain that flowed with white and red wine. Once they arrived at their destination, Anne began to make ready for her coronation at Westminster that was set to take place the following day, which was Whitsunday, the 1st of June. She was crowned with St Edward's crown, which had last been used during the coronation of her husband, Henry VIII, in 1509. It was the crown that was used to make him king. Much has been made of the fact that it was the traditional monarch's crown of coronation that was used for Anne. And indeed, it's also mentioned that she was the last of Henry's wives to have a coronation at all. And of course, it is possible that Henry was ordering things in this way to further solidify Anne's right to be honoured as his true wife and queen, that using St Edward's crown is a further sign of his affection for her and of how much he supported and backed her place. However, I think it is worth us remembering that at this point, Anne was around five months pregnant. Henry, of course, hoped that she was carrying his longed-for surviving legitimate son and heir. And so I think we have to ask, is Henry demanding honours for Anne with the use of St Edward's crown because of how much he loved and respected her? Or is he demanding those honours for the prince that he believed she was carrying? As it was, the baby that was born was a princess. 
Elizabeth, born on the 7th of September 1533. A little less than three years after Anne's coronation, on the 30th of April 1536, a court musician called Mark Smeaton was arrested and interrogated. Some even allege that he was tortured by Thomas Cromwell. Smeaton confessed to being the lover of Anne Boleyn, and apparently he also confessed more besides. The next day, the 1st of May, Henry Norris was arrested. Anne and her brother George were taken on the 2nd of May. They were soon joined by Francis Weston, William Brereton, Thomas Wyatt and Richard Page. The Tower of London was to be the prison of this Queen of England and her alleged lovers. Anne was arrested at Greenwich, and so this meant that she was going to have to make the exact same river journey that she had made just three years earlier. This time, though, she would not be travelling in triumph as the glittering centrepiece of an elaborate flotilla of pomp and pageantry. Instead, she was now going to find herself at the very heart of a new narrative of royal authority and justice. Once again, Anne alighted at the wharf, by the stairs beside the Byward Postern. It was through that same gateway that she once again entered the tower. This time, Henry was not there to meet her. Instead, she encountered Sir William Kingston, who was the constable of the tower. He reported that, quote, On my Lord of Norfolk and the King's Council departing from the tower, I went before the Queen into her lodging. She said unto me, Master Kingston, shall I go into a dungeon? I said, No, madam, you shall go into the lodging you lay in at your coronation. It is too good for me, she said. Jesu have mercy on me, and kneeled down weeping a good pace, and in the same sorrow fell into a great laughing, as she has done many times since. So once again, Anne was treading common ground, albeit under vastly different circumstances than the last time. A letter that is dated to the 6th of May 1536, and which is addressed to Henry VIII from Anne Boleyn, has been defended as being the genuine article by Sandra Vizzoli. She's written a book on it, which I will be leaving linked. If you have read Sandra Vizzoli's book, I would love to know your thoughts on her arguments. And also, I'd love to know what you think of the letter, which reads as follows. Sir, your grace's displeasure and my imprisonment are things so strange unto me as what to write or what to excuse I am altogether ignorant. Whereas you sent unto me, willing me to confess a truth, and so obtain your favour by such a one, whom you know to be my ancient and professed enemy. I no sooner received the message by him than I rightly conceived your meaning. And if, as you say, confessing truth may indeed procure my safety, I shall with all willingness and duty perform your command. But let not your grace ever imagine that your poor wife will ever be brought to acknowledge a fault, where not so much as thought thereof proceeded. And to speak a truth, never prince had wife more loyal in all duty, and in all true affection, than you have found in Anne Boleyn. With which name and place could willingly have contented myself, as if God and your grace's pleasure had been so pleased. Neither did I at any time so far forge myself in my exaltation or received queenship, but that I always looked for such an alteration as now I find. For the ground of my preferment being on no surer foundation than your grace's fancy, the least alteration I knew was fit and sufficient to draw that fancy to some other subject. You have chosen me from a low estate to be your queen and companion far beyond my desert or desire. If then you found me worthy of such honour, good your grace, let not any light fancy or bad counsel of mine enemies withdraw your princely favour from me. Neither let that stain, that unworthy stain of a disloyal heart towards your good grace, ever cast so foul a blot on your most dutiful wife and the infant princess, your daughter. Try me, good king, but let me have a lawful trial. 
and let not my sworn enemies sit as my accusers and judges. Yes, let me receive an open trial, for my truth shall fear no open shame. Then shall you see either my innocency cleared, your suspicion and conscience satisfied, the ignominy and slander of the world stopped, or my guilt openly declared, so that whatsoever God or you may determine of me, your grace may be freed from an open censure, and mine offence being so lawfully proved, your grace is at liberty both before God and man, not only to execute worthy punishment on me as an unlawful wife, but to follow your affection, already settled on that party, for whose sake I am now as I am, whose name I could some good while since have pointed unto, your grace being not ignorant of my suspicion therein. But if you have already determined of me, and that not only my death but an infamous slander must bring you the enjoying of your desired happiness, then I desire of God that he will pardon your great sin therein, and likewise mine enemies, the instruments thereof, that he will not call you to a strict account for your unprincely and cruel usage of me at his general judgment seat, where both you and myself must shortly appear, and in whose judgment I doubt not, whatsoever the world may think of me. My innocence shall be openly known and sufficiently cleared. My last and only request shall be that myself may only bear the burden of your grace's displeasure, and that it may not touch the innocent souls of those poor gentlemen who, as I understand, are likewise in straight imprisonment for my sake. If I have ever found favour in your sight, If the name of Anne Boleyn hath been pleasing to your ears, then let me obtain this request, and I will so leave to trouble your grace any further, with my earnest prayers to the Trinity to have your grace in his good keeping, and to direct you in all your actions. Your most loyal and ever faithful wife, Anne Boleyn, from my doleful prison, the Tower, this 6th of May. On the 12th of May, 1536, the commoners, Norris, Weston, Brereton and Smeaton, were put on trial and convicted of high treason. They were sentenced to death. As Anne and her brother George were noble, they were tried separately. Their trials took place on the 15th of May, in the Great Hall of the Tower of London, This was the very room that Anne had celebrated before her coronation with Henry and their courtiers, their closest friends and family members. This room was now the theatre of justice in which many of those same friends, companions and even family members would sit in judgment of Anne in the name of her husband and king. Both Anne and George were also convicted. The Treason Act of 1351 asserts that treason may be, quote, compassing the death of the king, queen, or their eldest son, violating the queen, or the king's eldest daughter unmarried, or his eldest son's wife, levying war, adhering to the king's enemies, killing the chancellor, treasurer, or judges in execution of their duty. Thus, I think it's fairly clear why the men who were accused and subsequently convicted of committing adultery with Anne the Queen can be adjudged to have been traitors, at least according to the 1351 Act, where it talks about it being treason to violate the wife of the king. That is what they've been convicted of. But if we think about the wording, it's pretty clear to me that that same behaviour is not treason in the Queen. It's treason for a man to violate the wife of the king, the eldest daughter of the king, and the wife of the king's heir. But nowhere in that is it treason for the queen. And indeed, it wasn't treason for a queen to behave in this way, at least not at that point. So then, if Anne is a traitor, what form did her treason take? It was reported that while Anne was questioning Henry Norris about his delay in marrying Anne's cousin Margaret Shelton, Anne turned to him and said, quote, 
you look for dead men's shoes. For if aught came to the king but good, you would look to have me. And just like that, she could be accused of having imagined the king's death. It was a short leap for anyone who had wished to pull Anne down to insinuate that this statement was, in fact, part of a plot. That Anne, referencing and imagining her husband's death, is part of inspiring people, her lover or lovers, that they should, in fact, murder Henry so that she, and they, because presumably she would marry one of them as a reward, could then go on to rule through Elizabeth, who was at this point a very small child. The men who had been tried and convicted for their alleged indiscretions with the Queen were all executed on Tower Hill on the 17th of May, 1536. All of them were beheaded using the block and axe. Two days later, on the 19th of May, Anne was taken from the royal lodgings. She was escorted to the scaffold that had been erected within the tower for the purpose. Henry had arranged for a swordsman to come and end the life of the woman that he had apparently once been so besotted with. Some have read this as Henry's final act of kindness towards Anne, because the sword was thought to be a cleaner and more accurate means of execution, and for the most part it does appear that that is borne out by the available evidence. An execution by sword is more likely to be finished, so to speak, in one blow. It is less likely that Anne would suffer through this means of execution. However, ordering the swordsman also minimises the chances of something going wrong, of this execution being botched. Because let's be clear, if it had taken more than one blow, this potentially could have caused Henry embarrassment. And this was, after all, the very first Queen of England who was going to be executed. A desire to control the narrative also goes some way to explain, I think, why Anne was executed within the Tower Walls, while her co-accused all died on Tower Hill. The Tower is, of course, a gated site. It offers the option of being able to control the audience it's an odd word for it, but the audience to the execution in a way that Tower Hill simply could and would not. The Tower of London, with its high walls, gates and officers, provides an option to control who could witness and thus report on an execution, in a way that could simply not be achieved at Tower Hill. Perhaps there's something else at play, because while you certainly can control ingress and egress to the Tower of London, while you can check who's coming in, who's coming out, who is seeing things and who therefore is not allowed to see things, that doesn't appear to have happened very well when it came to Anne Boleyn's execution. Seemingly, a fairly large, fairly diverse crowd was allowed to gather and watch her die. So, either the order to control people coming in and out wasn't given, or it wasn't appropriately followed. So let's circle back again to the sword. I do wonder whether Henry chose this traditionally French means of execution, the sword, as some kind of comment. Because sexual impropriety and Frenchness were strongly correlated in early modern England. I mean, after all, they referred to syphilis as the French pox. And so is it possible that Henry is making a statement about Anne's behaviour or indeed about her upbringing in the French court? Is he perhaps insinuating that that is what made her that way? That that somehow indoctrinated her, infected her with those alleged French practices which have now brought her to ruin? Is he then making the punishment fit the crime? Anne's scaffold speech is recorded by Edward Hall as follows. Good Christian people, I am come hither to die. For according to the law and by the law, I am judged to die. And therefore, I will speak nothing against it. I am come hither to accuse no man, nor to speak anything of that whereof I am accused and condemned to die. But I pray God save the king and send him long to reign over you. For a gentler nor more merciful prince was there never. And to me, he was ever a good, a gentle and sovereign lord. And if any person will meddle in my cause, I require them to judge the best. And thus I take my leave of the world, and of you all. And I heartily desire you all to pray for me. O Lord, have mercy on me. 
To God I commend my soul. And then she kneeled down, saying, To Christ I commend my soul. Jesu, receive my soul. Diverse times. Till that her head was stricken off with the sword. Almost at once, the ladies who had accompanied Anne to her execution removed her remains from the scaffold and saw to it that she was buried in the chapel of St Peter at Vincula. So what do you think of the sources and evidence that we have explored today? Of Anne's time spent at the Tower during her life? Of how Anne and the Tower are now, in many people's minds, inextricably linked? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video. But I would also love it if you could pop an emoji, or as we're calling them now, a social glyph, in the comments too. And that's because the more engagement this video gets, the more that YouTube seems to share it. And that helps to grow this community and thus have more people to talk about history with. So for an emoji or social glyph, let's do something either castly or queenie. So either pick something that represents the tower for you or that might represent Anne Boleyn. Additionally, you can find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all of the places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some or all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. And if you did, please do share it with your friends. In fact, if you like the channel, let some pals know about it too. And that way you'll have more people to chat about history with in real life. Please also let me know that you like this video by hitting the thumbs up and I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel. And if you think you're subscribed, have a little check now. Just make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you against your will. And while you are there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that's going to appear so that then, allegedly, they claim... <laughs> YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded and indeed when I am planning on going live. I hope you're going to have a great day whatever you're doing and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.